Well, thank you. Um, Uh, the curious world of honeybees, the Apis mellifera, which is the European honeybee. And these are the three types of bees you're going to find in a bee colony. And the first one over here is the drone. And the drone has, sorry, my, oh, I got it going backwards. The worker, sorry, on the right hand side is the worker, they're female. They can uh, make up the majority of the population in the hive. And then the drone is on the left. The characteristics are the drone has these big beady eyes, mm -hmm. a very short and stout abdomen. The female has a longer and slightly pointed abdomen. And then the almighty queen in the center. Uh, mm -hmm. The queen could have been a worker bee, or to say it better, a worker bee could have been a queen had the conditions in the hive been uh, correct. 90% of the bees in your hive are going to be of the worker variety, female. 10% of the drones. And you usually see a larger drone population about this time of the year, May, late April, early May, because it's it's the season of swarming. So the honeybee colony is very efficient in its uses of resources. The drone isn't good for much of anything. He can't feed himself. He can't defend the hive. He doesn't have a stinger. Uh, he can't forage for food. So his only purpose in life is to mate with a newly emerged queen that's a virgin. And once he mates with the queen, he falls off and dies. So it's not a very uh, fun life as the drone. In the, in the queen, in most of the hives, uh, there's one in every colony. About 20% of hives naturally occurring will have two queens at any one time. Sometimes it's indefinitely, and sometimes it's a very short period of time as the mother queen waits for the daughter queen to come back and get mated before she flies out with half the colony and creates a swarm. A strong hive can have between 60 and 100,000 honeybees. Uh, it might be a little lower coming out of winter like we're currently doing. We're a little bit past that now, so colonies are starting to build up very rapidly. And they hit their peak somewhere towards the middle of June and July, and then they start to, to slowly uh, come back down to that 60,000 bees uh, going into winter. What I'm trying to show here is the gestation period of each of the three bees. They all are an egg for three days. After the third day, they hatch and become a larvae. And they all get capped except for the drone on day eight, nine, weather depending, temperature depending. The drone gets capped on day 10 or 11. The queen will emerge on day 16. The worker be on day 21. And because we're guys and we're a little slow, on day 24, the drone will emerge. <laughs> I like to pick on the guys because we're just that way, I guess. Okay, moving on to the duties carried out by the worker bees. So as the bee emerges from the cell, the first two days they do housekeeping. They clean the cell they came out of and they help clean any other recently emerged cells where brood has come out and they help keep the brood warm. So that's the cat, larvae, and pupa. Uh, the honeybee colony throughout uh, the entirety of the year tries to keep the center of the colony at 92 to 93 degrees. When it's minus 20 degrees out in the middle of winter in a northern Michigan winter, the center of that colony is probably slightly over 92 to 2 degrees and 
cools out to about 50 degrees outside the uh, the colony as it, uh, um, I just lost the word, as it, as it clusters. Thank you, Rodney. Day three to five, uh, they start feeding the older larvae and they feed it bee bread, which is a mixture of honey and pollen. And somewhere around day six through day 11, they have a gland in their head that creates royal jelly. And so every egg, once it hatches into a larvae, gets fed royal jelly. If you're going to be a worker bee, you also get fed bee bread and royal jelly. The queen, as I mentioned earlier, any of the worker bees larvae could have been the queen if the conditions were right, meaning they're getting ready to swarm and they need to create a new queen. The colony senses that the queen is failing. She's not laying enough eggs. They sense that the queen is damaged somehow. She's broken an antenna or she's dragging a leg. When they discover that or decide that they're going to swarm, they will only feed a very freshly 12 to 24 hour hatched egg, so a larvae. They will only feed it royal jelly. And because of that, she will mature into a queen. Uh, between days 12 and 17, their wax glands on their abdomen become very productive and they'll produce these flakes of wax and it's white, it's crystals. It's almost, it's almost glass-like, but you can still see. It's not crystal clear, but it looks very much like uh, crushed glass if your entire windshield gets hit by something. And they dehydrate the honey by flapping their wings and by uh, sipping a little bit of the nectar out of the cell, letting their body absorb, absorb moisture and then re-depositing uh, that uh, liquid into the comb. And that process of fanning and drinking in and out reduces the water content of the nectar from 80% water content to below uh, 17%. Anything above 17, well, it's actually 18.1, but anything above 18.1 will ferment. Anything lower than 18.1 will stay as honey as long as it's capped, because honey is uh, hydroscopic. And you can even eat the honey out of an Egyptian tomb if you come across it. 3,000 years old and still edible. Uh, between days 18 and 21, they start to guard the entrance and help ventilate the hive. So on really hot days, they line up at the entrance and they fan. And if you actually go out to your colony and stick your hand behind their butts, you can feel a breeze coming. They're moving air. It's helping that dehydrate the honey and keep that temperature at that 92 degree mark. All that, those first 21 days, three weeks, they're inside the colony progressing through the duties required inside the colony. Around day 22 to their death, um, they forage. And they forage for pollen, nectar, water, and propolis. And propolis is the sap from pine trees and conifer trees. It's antimicrobial, antibacterial. And they, they, they lick their tongues on all the surfaces they can reach inside the hive and deposit, the, deposit this because it makes it sterile. Inside each one of those little uh, cells in the wax gets a fresh coat of propolis once the bees have emerged. They go back and clean it. Are they kind of trees? That, that they're busy, busy as a bee is, is an understatement. What other kind of trees? Yeah. Just so, right. yep. Uh, when I write death here, it depends on when the bee is living. In the springtime, when they're out flying, they usually live about six weeks in total. So the first half of their life is inside the hive, and the last half of their hive is outside. Um, they typically die while they're out foraging. They just, they're like an airplane with a wingspan, and they keep getting tipped of their wings cut off shorter and shorter. And pretty soon they put too much 
weight on themselves that they can't physically fly and they'll die out in the field. Mm -hmm. um, in the winter time or in the fall, the queen starts raising what is commonly called winter bees. And these bees are, are structurally a little bit different uh, makeup than the, than the spring bees and the summer bees. The spring bees and summer bees are very lean, mean, fighting machines. But the winter bees become a little more heavy set. They put on lots of fat inside their exoskeleton and they live off that fat during the winter. Everybody thinks that they consume the honey, but if you put monitors, weight monitors on your hives, You'll, you'll watch that if you leave a hive going into winter at 140 pounds and 80 of that is honey, you won't see a dramatic weight drop until April, sometimes February or March, when the bees start feeding that honey to the eggs that the queen is laying. In the wintertime, the queen doesn't lay a whole lot, so there's not a lot of brood being raised, and there's not a lot of need for nectar or honey to be consumed. But once they get on the kick that spring's coming and they need a workforce to gather the pussy willows and the maple trees and the dandelions and all the, the early, early vegetation that they, they gather their resources from, they need to have a workforce going. So the, the winter bees live off the fat, the spring bees live off the, the, the food that they're bringing in. And there's also a, a group of workers that will tend to the queen during their first 21 days. So the queen actually has a court. And as the queen walks around the hive, her, her only goal in life is to lay eggs. She doesn't feed herself. They bring the food to her. When she has excrement, they take it away. When she's walking around, they're constantly grooming her. They're picking up the pheromones of the queen and dispersing them through the hive. And that's how the hive understands the condition that they're in. Everything's pheromone driven. If the queen is giving off a bad pheromone, they're gonna supersede her, replace her. If the queen's doing a really good job, everybody's happy inside the hive. And you know very quickly when you go into a colony, the condition of your queen, if, she's, if it's changed dramatically, they'll be really pissy, They'll be more defensive. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't want you in there. So it's, it's, it's really, really interesting to, to watch the inner workings of the colony. Hmm. Another thing that you've probably all heard of is the, the waggle dance by the bees to, to simulate or to, to, to transfer the knowledge of where they're finding food, pollen and nectar and water. So imagine you're in a dark box, it's 90 some degrees, it's pretty humid in there, and you're trying to figure out or tell somebody where to go find the food. So the forager's gone out and they've paid attention to the direction they've headed from the front of the entrance to the azimuth direction polarity of the sun. And if they fly out and they find something, they said, well, I flew 30 degrees to where the sun was. And then they fly back. And if the food is directly out in front of the hive, when they walk up the frame, they waggle and they buzz. And then they turn and they walk back up that line, they turn in the opposite direction. And they don't buzz when they, when they come around through here. They only buzz when they start doing this vertical movement or the straight movement. And that's telling the bees, if I vibrate very, very quickly, it's a great food source. If I vibrate very slow, it's a not so good food source. If I do it for a very short period of time, a few, mil a few seconds, the food source is very close. If I waggle for a long time up the straight, the food source is very distant. And so they'll repeat this. And what happens is these bees next to the, the, the waggle dancing bee feel the vibrations and they can figure out what they're trying to tell each other. 
if it's 30 degrees or 45 degrees or 90 degrees, this angle would represent that. So this is saying at 30 degrees is where the food source is. So that's 30 degrees to the front of the hive. If the food source was over here directly to the left or right of the hive, she would waggle going from west to east. If the food source is behind the hive, is now a, a downward angle. So it's saying go away from the sun directly. Or if it was 30 degrees over here in this corner, she'd waggle down this line. It's an amazing thing to watch this happen. Any questions? Boy, how'd they get to be so smart? No. It's, it's really, it's just millions and millions of years. Yeah. So as I was saying earlier, the duties carried out by the queen. So she's just emerged. She's a virgin queen. Day one to three, she does nothing. Her exoskeleton and wings need to harden. So she runs around inside the hive. She doesn't smell. Again, the, her pheromone's going to change over time. She doesn't exactly smell like a worker bee. She doesn't exactly smell like a drone. So she kind of is darty and hides and just trying to pray that nothing comes along and decides to harm her because she doesn't smell like a queen. They might view her as an invader. So it's awfully hard sometimes to find these virgin queens when they've just uh, emerged from their cell. Somewhere around day four to day 21, on a nice weather day, today's not that day. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday, I think I was downstate, but I think when I got home, it was sunny, no clouds in the sky, it was fairly warm. That's the perfect, and, and, and wind is kind of plays a, a part of it too. You don't want it to be too terribly windy, but she'll go on a mating flight. And it's always been assumed that she flies one time, comes back, and she's mated. Uh, they're finding that sometimes the queen recognizes that she hasn't mated well. She's a little, she's a little promiscuous when she's out flying around because she'll mate with 10 to 15 drones. The more drones she makes, the better the uh, 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 diversity inside the hive. Um, there are many species of or strains of bees that have been brought into North America, mostly originating from Europe. So there's an Italian bee, the uh, a German bee, there's a, a Carnolian, Russian, and all these bees uh, over in Europe were se separated by mountain ranges. So as evolution went along, they developed genetics that were very specific to those regions. And part of those genetics were color, some of some of the genetics were uh, disposition. Are they very defensive? Not very defensive. Some of it is, can they fly at colder temperatures? Uh, some of them are, do they build up really really quick and stop really really quick, or do they have a nice easy start to their laying and and drop back off at the end? So all these all the honeybees in North America were imported at one point in time. And a, a, one of the facts that people often state is, well, honeybees aren't uh, 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 originating in North America, when in fact, uh, they have found amber with a honeybee in it that originated in North America. Hmm. So bees at one time were in North America and they died out for some reason. And so they've been, like I like to say, reintroduced like like uh, bison and everything else, right? Well, they've been reintroduced. Uh, so she mates with 10 to 15 drones. Then on day seven to 10 after her mating flight is when she really starts laying. At the first little bit, she's not very, she's not in a lot of control of her ovaries and her laying habits. So she may lay one or two eggs in a cell she may walk around with eggs hanging out of her abdomen. Really got it down pat. She's laying anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 eggs a day. The 2,000 eggs a day is basically laying her body weight every single day. 
Uh, if I had a chicken that could lay 2,000 eggs a day, I'd be a rich man. Uh, the queens can live five to seven years, but usually is replaced after the second or third year. And her very best year is the year leading up to the first nectar flow or honey crop that she's going to oversee. So right now I've got colonies with queens in them that were raised in Georgia and California. They were raised very early this spring, February, March. This is going to be her absolute best laying year typically. Next year, she may lay well, but she probably won't lay at the rate she lays today. Sometimes during the summer, the hives have a genetic disposition that says, okay, we just had a queen and we know she just went through her best laying period ever. We're going to supersede it. They work out just fine next year, but they're going to supersede her because they want a young, vibrant, enthusiastic queen to go through the winter. She's strong. She hasn't been tired out by laying these millions of eggs in, in a few months. They want something fresh. They think, for some reason, they think that that gives them the best chance of making it through the winter. Typically, I like to replace my queen's or at least make a split off a colony once or twice a year. So colonies that have made it through this winter, I pull the queen, I let the uh, remainder, I pull the queen and a few frames of bees, I let the remainder of the hive raise their own queen. And that is my way of controlling swarming and to make sure I have a, at least one really good queen getting ready for the honey flow this, this, uh, this Spring, late spring. And then again in the fall, I can, I, I'll, I'll sometimes replace queens. And like I said earlier, duties carried out by the drone, day one to 21, nothing. They get, they, when they stick their heads out of the cell, they start screaming for somebody to feed me, feed me, feed me. I can't take care of myself. And for 21 days, they get to do that. <laughs> Uh, the drone, like I said, can't defend the hive. It has no stinger. The drones can't forage, so they're not bringing in nectar, pollen, water, or propolis. They can't feed themselves. So another joke I always like to say is the drones like your buddy that you don't want coming around your fraternity house when your girlfriend's there. Because all they're going to do is chase your girlfriend, drink your beer, and eat your food. So... <laughs> so Day Can 20... I pose a question? Sure. Uh, the uh, the ability to keep the hive at the at the ninety ninety two de yep. two degree temperature, uh, they the the worker bees have to be able to produce heat. Do they do this by uh, uh, metastasizing the uh, honey that they're consuming? It's a, it's a little bit of both the, of everything, depending on the time of the year. So when it's really hot outside, if I packed a small room with 400 people, no air conditioning, it gets pretty warm. So it's just their own body heat that, that they have just by living. In the springtime, they will cluster. So they'll get shoulder to shoulder as tight as they can in the wintertime too, but coming out of, let's say coming out of winter this time of the year, they are going to all congregate on a few frames to the point where they know that if we keep our social distancing at this rate, we can keep the temperature at 92. Then when a cold day comes or a cold night comes, they may squeeze that cluster in from a eight or nine inch diameter ball inside the hive down to a seven inch diameter ball because that's what it takes to keep that center core at that temperature. And the next day it's hundred degrees. Well, now they don't want to be anywhere near each other. They're like four arm lengths away and they cover all the frames inside your column. So it's, it's, just the, it's just weather dependent on really cold winters. What they'll do is their wings 
are attached to a set of muscles and they can unhinge the wing from that muscle. And they can sit there and do jumping jacks basically without their wings moving, right? They're moving those muscles like they're trying to fly and that creates the heat. And then they will eat the nectar or honey. Uh, they actually reconstitute it. So the honey, like I said earlier, is seven or 18% water content or lower. They'll actually take the moisture that can condensates inside the hive from the respiration and mix it in with the honey to bring it back up to 70 or 80% liquid. So it's a constant grab the nectar, dehydrate it in the winter, rehydrate it in the spring, rehydrate it so I can feed it to the young bees. Do you, um, if, if you have these, um, um, hives out in your field, I presume under your apple tree or wherever, in the wintertime in Michigan, can you go out and put a cone over it or something to kind of help with the with uh, insulation of the hive or, or do you just sleep? It, 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 it depends on what you want to do for beekeeping. There's all different schools and I'll make the joke that if you ask 10 beekeepers a question, you'll get 20 different answers. <laughs> um, I, I have moved to, I won't say it's radical, but it's, it's a newer school of beekeeping. The old school of beekeeping was you bought a, 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 a wooden ware is what it's called. You bought a bottom board, you bought a deep brood box, which is roughly, it's just round numbers. It's 10 inches deep. It's not quite 10 inches, but we'll use 10 inches. You stack two of those on top of each other. And then you put your honey supers on, which are, call it seven inches. They're really six and three quarters or something like that. And you stack those on it. The bees fill everything up with honey at the top. When it's uh, your turn, you take a, a box of that, excuse me, a box of that honey or two boxes of that honey, depending on how much honey they have in the two deep brood boxes. And you walk away and you let the bees go and they make it through winter. With the advent of mono uh, crops grown, so vast swaths of corn or soybean or wheat in North America, and every hedgerow is being taken out, and every place we can spray to kill uh, weeds is, is taken advantage of, there's, there's not a lot of good forage for the bees in some places. Um, the corn, yes, it has pollen, but it's self-pollinated by the wind. It's not very good pollen for the bees. Uh, you can get, depending on what soybean is planted, some of them are also self-pollinating by the wind, or they don't give off very good pollen or a lot of nectar for uh, the bees to forage on. And wheat is basically of no value. So you take all the acreage, if you think around where you're at, at least where I'm at, that's a lot of that's a lot of tillage. That's that's pretty much useless for the bees. So to, to counter that, and the fact that there is a nice little uh, vampire called a varroa mite, it's a pest. Um, it lives uh, on bees until it gets a chance to reproduce in with the brood. Um, those are both the food sources and the parasite, the varroa mite, really, really make it hard for bees to make it through the winter. So a lot of people have changed their overwintering techniques. Uh, I put inch and a half foam boxes. Basically, it's a cooler that I made from the blue Dow wall insulation. You can go buy at Home Depot or the Pink Panther one from Corning. Uh, I cut them so that it's literally it's an ice chest upside down and I slip that over top of the hives uh, to, to add an extra layer of insulation. Um, the, the big key I found is you have to keep the drones, or excuse me, the varroa mite levels very low in your hive and you don't want a hive that's overly spacious. And what I mean by that is if, if I put a 
two deep boxes and two honey supers on and give them 120 pounds of honey to get through the winter, which is way more than enough. What happens is the bees cluster in one third of the bottom box. And yes, that cluster is 100 or 90 some degrees, but you start going up each box and pretty soon it's outdoor temperature in that box. They're not creating enough heat to, to, to keep every corner of that uh, in, enclosure at that temperature. And so what happens is the respiration is warm, it rises, it gets to a point where it can condense on the honey. It typically turns into a still not a problem. It builds up until it's like your deep freezer that you haven't opened in a couple months and you have a big old frost ball on the top of it. And when we get that first nice day in the spring, it all melts. And you lose body heat and the bees lose body heat seven times faster when you're wet than when you're dry. And so what happens is they, they, they lose the ability to keep themselves warm and they, they pass away. It kills them. So, so, so what people are doing, you know, the, the, the big people, the people who run 15 to 2,000 or more, especially up in Canada and Alberta and Saskatchewan, they actually build sheds where they're temperature controlled. Uh, the bees eat the least amount of food when the outside temperature is around 40 degrees Fahrenheit any warmer than that, and they become more active. And when they're active, they need the carbohydrates to survive. So they start eating the honey and what little pollen's in the hive. When it's colder than 40 degrees, you start getting into the negative numbers. They have to heat a lot, eat a lot to keep the heat inside the hive by doing those cal calisthenics to create the heat, keep the colony going. So these guys make big sheds they stack them in single eight, eight to 10 frame deep boxes. They stack them four to a pallet, four or five pallets high. They control the inlet temperature of the air coming in and they actually control the makeup of the air. If they can, if they can increase the carbon dioxide level inside the hive, there's a point to where it will kill this varroa mite but it won't kill the honeybee. So if, if you say, if I get to, I don't know what the number is, but if you get to 15% CO2 concentration inside the shed, the varroa mite starts dying until it gets to 25% then the honeybees start dying. So if they can keep that CO2 concentration in between the two, it helps rid the colonies of the parasite. Hmm. You're really better off letting the bees manage themselves. They seem to do a better job than when humans get involved with it. Yes, and that's why I always tell people, if you get a hive, don't be afraid of screwing it up because <laughs> they know how to fix it better yeah. than you. And there's, yeah. and you, 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 can, you can learn the, you know, oh, I think I killed the queen, okay. Well, wait a few days and see if you find queen cells. Well, I don't find any queen cells. Okay, do you see eggs or larvae? I don't see eggs or larvae. Okay, you probably killed the queen and they didn't figure it out in time. So that <laughs> hive cannot make a queen. So go over to another hive or ask another beekeeper for a frame of eggs and you stick it in place in your hive somewhere. And the bees will say, oh, look, manna from the sky. Someone or some person gave us a fresh start. Here's some eggs. We just have to wait till they turn into larvae. Oh, they're larvae. Let's make queen cells. We make queen cells. And in 30 days, they have a laying queen. So you can, you can screw it up as badly as you want to. And most of the time, they can, they can straighten it out for you. God, amazing. Amazing. So uh, I've answered some of these questions, but we'll still go through it. In, in January and March, this is how the the hive operates uh, around, the, around the calendar year. They cluster to maintain a temperature inside the hive. The center of that cluster, like I said, is between 91 and 93 degrees. At the edge of the cluster, the temperature will be 40 or 45 degrees. And that's about the temperature at which the bees start becoming lethargic. 
their blood starts to thicken. They can't move it around. They're unable to move. They almost go into a state of animation. So once that starts to happen, they grab a little bit of moisture that they can get their tongues onto, and they start moving in towards the center of that cluster to warm their bones. And the bees are at the center of the cluster, like, man, it's hot in here. I need to shed some clothes. So they start working their way out. So it's always this work my way out, get cold, grab some water, work my way in. Oh, everybody's thirsty here, have some water. Oh, it's hot again, I'm moving back out. And it's this cycle, in and out, in and out, in and out. And that's how they survive. The queen will uh, start ramping up her legs in late January, early February, during the fall and winter months where it's cold. Um, obviously, if you're in the Southern hemisphere, this is all reversed. Uh, this would be going into winter down there. This is us coming out of winter. And if you're around the equator, you really never see this, this clustering uh, effect because there's usually something always in bloom. Uh, go ahead. Uh, during the, during the, the fall and winter months, the queen has slowed down and sometimes she'll stop laying eggs altogether for a week or two, sometimes three or four. And, and what the, and what they're, why she's laying is she's just laying enough bees so that when it's time to come out of winter, there's enough heat inside the colony to keep those eggs and larvae warm so the next generation, the next year of bees can get off to a good start. If you have a very, very small cluster, let's say a size of a softball, bees come through the winter, they will stay a size of a softball almost all year long unless you add some resources to them because they can't go out and forage a whole lot because you need, for example, 10,000 bees to keep just the inner workings of the hive going. And if you're at 10,000, you don't have an extra bee to send out to go forage for food. When you have 10,000 and one bee, now you have one bee that can go out and forage. And if you have 20,000 bees, you'd have 10,000 bees staying home and 10,000 bees foraging. So there's, there's a bare minimum where they can stay alive, but they can't grow. And if they get under that, they'll actually just shrink and die just because they don't have the resources to cover bees, get food, and so forth. Uh, the bees are patiently waiting since the last day over, say, 40 degrees to go out on a cleansing fight. So, so here, I think this year, it finally got to where they couldn't do, go on a cleansing flight somewhere around the middle of December. So two weeks of December, four weeks of January, I think four weeks of February, I think somewhere in March, we got a 50 or 60 degree day. And if there would have been snow on the ground, it would have looked like somebody had stood behind the hive and spit tobacco for a week because the ground would just be brown and yellow from all their defecation. Uh, mm. they, don't, they don't defecate inside the hive. They have to keep it sanitary. And because of that, they can uh, they get something called nosema. It's a dysentery disease. Uh, April and June. Hey, pollen to feed to the young larvae. Now there's a big drive. They're, they're, they will consume from April to June uh, a gallon of honey a week. Whoa. Uh, so that when I say a gallon of honey, it's really a, uh, enough nectar to make a gallon because they never actually turn it into honey. They're, as, as the nectar comes in, they're feeding it, turning around and feeding it right back to the bees. So all this time frame, you really don't see any honey stores being created unless there's a super abundance of nectar. I mean, just crazy amounts, copious amounts where the bees can't, can't feed it to anybody. So they just start storing it as honey. Uh, almost everything being gathered is consumed by the larvae and the worker bees. The hive is reaching its maximum capacity quickly and swarming might occur if the beekeeper leaves the hive unchecked. Usually in our area, 
Um, it's starting to happen now down at my hives in Ingham County and Clinton County. Uh, one of the hives, I believe, found about 20 queen cells. The other hive, I found the queen uh, and they were just starting to make queen cells. And the third hive is at my parents' house in Ingham County. And uh, I didn't get a chance to check it. And I'm afraid that when I go back this Saturday, uh, it probably has swarmed. I'll be lucky if it hasn't. So if, it, if it's swarmed, does that mean you've lost your queen? It means I've lost the queen that came through the winter. Oh, okay. So that so the, the queen that came through the winter started ramping up. Food was coming in so fast, and the, they overcrowded themselves. Yeah, okay. So one of the ways you, you combat that is if you're ahead of the game, you throw extra space, extra boxes on top of the hive and give them somewhere to go and somewhere to store. Oh. Warming instinct really kicks in. Uh, if you think of a tree cavity, uh, they attach the comb at the top of the cavity. They store all the nectar and honey above them. As that comb comes down, the queen starts laying eggs and they keep drawing the comb down as far as they can. At some point, depending on the size of the cavity, there's more honey coming in than the queen can lay. So as, as bees are emerging, 2,000 bees a day, they, they call it fat filling. The, the bee comes out, they clean the cell, and they stick nectar in it. Well, the queen can't lay in a cell that's got nectar, honey, or pollen, or bee bread in it. She has to have a sterile, empty cell. And what happens is there's a fight for space, and the queen usually ends up losing out. And that's when the bees say, hey, look, we got to stop, take a time out. We're going to have the queen swarm in seven days. We're going to find some larvae today. We're going to start making queen cells. Once those are capped, that's usually the clue for the queen to, to skedaddle. And she'll take at least half of the hive with her. So if that population was 60,000, it falls to about 30,000. What that does is it usually coincides when the food isn't in huge demand. So they start making additional uh, honey stores. When the mated queen comes back and starts laying, they've left a patch purposely open for her to lay in. When she starts laying, now the food source outside the colony isn't so great. So they start consuming the resources that they've stored and opening up more cells. Now they're consuming more food than's coming in. Space is being created. The queen starts laying. She makes all those winter bees. And then when she starts slowing down in August, September, you hopefully have a good goldenrod, a good aster uh, crop. Um, if someone's planted uh, buckwheat, there's usually something in floral going there. All those flaw, fall flowering uh, species of plants provide the crop basically of honey going into the winter. Um, the queen really starts uh, slowing down her egg laying after summer solstice, which is June 21st or 22nd or 20th somewhere, depending on the year. As fewer mouths are needed to be fed, more and more of the nectar gets stored. So that, that gallon of honey, that, or gallon, the, the nectar to make the gallon of honey is now going into actual honey. It's not being consumed. And, and these, these will last until spring. When the food sources start to produce, the willows start are the first things. Pussy willows are usually the first thing in Michigan that comes out. It's usually too cold for the bees to get any food off of it because they can't fly. The big, the big, big crop uh, down downstate, a little bit around here, are the maples, the red maples in particular. They actually fly. Maple trees have little tiny flowers on them and multiple flowers on each little bud. Uh, that's a huge crop of, of pollen and nectar. Uh, 
then the bees that are being raised in July and September are the winter bees, and those, these bees will live six months. And it's, it's mostly because they're not flying and tattering their wings. They actually die of old age versus dying because I just physically can't fly back to the, to the colony. Uh, in October, December, this is really where there's not much going on in the hive. Uh, the, the colony will cluster in a ball around the queen to keep her alive. The queen may lay a few hundred eggs every 21 days to offset the bees that are lost during this period. And for three months, the population inside the hive is at its lowest point. And what are we doing here? Oh. So what's causing the decline of the honeybee population? The number one enemy is the varroa mite. This little guy, this little guy, this little guy. They're all females. They're a nasty, nasty creature. Uh, the mother mite will go into a cell. This is what the mother mite looks like. Has all these legs and hairs on them, claws. They crawl in with the larvae right before it gets capped on day eight, nine. They first lay an egg that's a male. Then every 36 hours, they lay another egg. <coughs> They're all females. And when these and the males will die, and typically in a worker cell, you will increase the population by 1.5 mites. So sometimes out of one cell, you'll get one mite, and uh, sometimes out of another cell, you'll get two mites, and it averages to be about 1.5. If these mites get in with the drones, the drones live an extra three days. And because of that, the average mite coming out increase in population is two and a half mites instead of one and a half mites. Instinctually, these mites would rather reproduce and with the drones, they know that that gives them the best chance of getting the most number of mites. Um, like I said, they like to, they prefer the drone brood. The adult female enters the cell on day eight after the egg has been laid. Oh, I was wrong, got my numbers wrong. She lays the first egg 60 hours after entering the cell and then lays an egg every 36 hours. The first offspring is still the male and then proceeds to lay female mites. Uh, the female mates with her brother. All mites in the cell live off the lymph. Uh, this is not correct. I just didn't correct this slide. The hemoph hemolymph, which is the bee blood, it's actually they're living off the fat, the fat bodies in the larvae. Uh, this mite can host uh, a variety of bee viruses and provides an easy entry for the virus through the wound they inflict on the bees. The bee's exoskeleton is, is pierced uh, and it never heals. It's always an oozing mess. So it's, it's sort of like uh, MRSA. You get a, a, a wound that stays open all the time and it never heals. And so now there's a, a weak spot, a point of entry for all these diseases to get established inside your colony. That's why it's becoming more and more important uh, to treat over a very extended period of time. The, the, the thought process originally was monitor the mite level, when it gets to a certain threshold, treat, knock them down, wait till they get to the threshold again, treat again. And the fear was that the, the treatments that they came up with, they found the mites were able to become resistant to them, sort of like becoming resistant to uh, uh, antibiotics. Mm. So that's why they wanted to treat only when absolutely necessary. Um, I have moved away from that theory and I, I try to make sure that never gets a, 
foothold in my colony so that these viruses can't get a foothold in the colony. And if you can do that, I think you have much better, healthier, stress-free bees going into winter. Uh, the second biggest uh, detriment to the bees is this thing called a neonicotinoid. It's an insecticide. It's a derivative of nicotine. Uh, they use it in agricultural as being applied to the crop seed, the soybean, the corn. I think there's a few other. I don't think they put it on wheat. It's systemic. So when that kernel uh, sprouts, that poison is sucked into the plant and it goes everywhere. So it's in the leaves, it's in the stalk, it's in the pollen. And that's the, that's the key, it gets into the pollen and when they, they've tested uh, levels of neonicotinoid in pollen on bees, purposely spiking the pollen. And they find that the least little amount of pollen basically gets these bees high. They can't figure out how to get home. So they'll be out foraging out in the field. They come across it and now all of a sudden they can't go anywhere um, and they die out in the field. Um, it doesn't typically kill the bees immediately, but over time it appears to make the bees unable to forage or return to their hive. And it's the, it's the major suspect of uh, colony collapse disease, which you'll hear called CCD. It's where one day your hive looks normal, you come back the next day and there's nothing in the hive, all the bees have left. Um, the foragers go, uh, the, 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 the nurse bees are normally are working inside the hive, can't figure out what's going on because they've been fed this pollen as well and they just take off. And what you typically find is you find a queen and you find brood that uh, eminently has been emerging. So uh, anything that's not within a few hours of merging gets too cold and dies, but you get just a few that uh, they didn't need the body heat from the colony to keep them warm enough in order to get out, but your hive is essentially dead. Mm -hmm. Some of the viruses that we see is this deformed wing virus. The wing looks like it's all shriveled up. Um, when you start seeing that in your colony, you have a very bad infestation. Uh, your, that colony probably is just a dead colony walking. Um, you also see this acute bee paralysis where they kind of sit there and shake. Uh, your queen cells, uh, they never open you know, they never fully emerge and you look at them and the larvae on the inside, the pupa on the inside is black versus white. Uh, this lake Sinai, this is one that they, uh, is called Lake Sinai because the uh, Israelis uh, discovered that. This cashmere virus was discovered by uh, a college institution there. Same with this uh, Israeli acute paralysis. I mean, there's just everything you can talk of. And there's also another one on here that I didn't list. It's called K-wing. And the bees actually have two sets of wings. They have a, a large left and right wing and then a smaller left and right wing. And when they're out flying, they actually are able to hook those two together. So they can collapse their wings when they're inside the hive. And this makes it so they can't. They're out, their, their big wing is almost uh, perpendicular to the body on both sides and their small wing kind of comes out and makes the K. Hmm. Uh, then there's a bunch of bacterial and fungal diseases that you can have. So there's an American fowl brood and there's a European fowl brood. Uh, what you're seeing in this picture is the American fowl brood. If you discover that your colonies have American fowl brood, you burn everything. It's highly contagious and it will wipe out your apiary. Uh, some individuals will actually go to the extent of burning every hive in that apiary uh, just to keep it from spreading because it gets on your hive tool, it gets on your clothes. And when you go from apiary to apiary or colony to colony, you can transport those spores with you. The European fowl brood 
is not quite as deadly. Um, typically, the hive can right itself if it, if it comes down with this. Typical ways of doing that is removing uh, the old queen and putting a new queen in there so that she lays really quickly and you can dilute the virus. Uh, the virus replicates much, much slower than the bees can produce bees. So over time, it becomes less prominent in your hive on a percentage basis. And you feed them uh, uh, some, anti there's antibiotics you can feed them and you can feed them sugar water and that typically gets them back in check. If caught early, you're pretty successful. Uh, if, you, if you catch it fairly late, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lost cause. The only upside is you don't have to burn your equipment. You don't have to torch it. Uh, this is chalk brood right here, and this is stone brood. Um, it's, it's interesting, you can see in the middle picture, uh, both ends appear to be a piece of chalk. And this one, you can kind of still see the larvae, the larvae head, but the rest of it has calcified. Um, it's just a strange disease. You see this in some hives. Some hives have it more than others, um, and it too usually clears itself up. Um, once a hive has plenty of food and resources and the stress level inside the hive uh, depreciates. Uh, stress, like, like in humans, stress can call, cause a lot of bad things to happen inside your colony. Moving them all the time, uh, having a skunk or, or something come up and knock on the front door and the defensive bees, the garden bees come out and they get eaten. The raccoon says, well, that wasn't so bad. Or the opossum says, that wasn't so bad. So they knock some more. And this just goes on night after night after night. It's, and usually when you go out there to, 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 to work the hive, they're really pissy. So that's another good signal that uh, something's bothering your hive. Here's the K-wing right here. It's not the best of pictures. Usually this wing right here is, is much farther away from the abdomen. And normally these wings lay flush with the abdomen. Um, then there's two nosemas, nosema serrata and nosema apis. Uh, again, it's a dysentery type disease. Uh, it's becoming less and less of a factor. So, you know, maybe it's something that the bees are uh, themselves becoming accustomed to and can, can deal with it on their own. Um, Typically, you see this nosema occur in bees that are stressed during the wintertime. You don't see this very much during the spring or summer or fall. And then lastly, you know, products from the hive. Um, the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans all use the hive as their medical chest. Honey is antibacterial and breaks down into hydrogen peroxide. The propolis I spoke about earlier is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, and it's useful in, in treatments of some cancers. Beeswax is non-allergenic, has non-allergenic properties. It's anti-inflammatory, it's an antioxidant. And when burned, produces an ion that's neutralized in the air, or that neutralizes the air, excuse me. The bee pollen is considered a superfood. It helps with allergies. It's approximately 40% protein. It's considered one of nature's most completely nourishing foods. It contains nearly all the nutrients required by humans. About half of its protein is in the form of free amino acids that are readily used directly by the body. Uh, royal jelly uh, has been used to treat asthma, hay fever, liver disease, pancreatitis, uh, sleep troubles, insomnia, premenstrual syndrome, stomach ulcers, kidney disease, bone fractures, menopausal symptoms, skin disorders, and high cholesterol. And then medicinally, if anybody wants to be a victim, I mean a, a patient, um, I can help you with arthritis by giving you bee stings. <laughs> um, a, a funny side note, I haven't followed up recently, but when the COVID first hit, there was a study done in Wuhan about beekeepers and people who were medicinally getting stung by bees on a regular basis. 
They studied somewhere close to a thousand beekeepers in these patients. And none of them, even though people in close proximity came down with the virus. So there's their uh, immune system. I get stung all the time. I actually uh, like this time of year because I've gone three or four months without getting stung. Um, there are spots that I don't enjoy getting stung, like ankles and wrists. Any place that there's not a lot of meat on the bones really, really hurts. Uh, but, you know, people will be out working bees. They're in bee suits. I'm in shorts, T-shirt, flip-flops, uh, no veil. I don't smoke the bees. And I'll say, oop, yep, that was a bee sting. And they look at me and like, yeah, it got me right here. No big deal. Keep going. And they're like, how can you not just freak out? Like, you get stung enough, it doesn't hurt anymore. So um, I like to get stung. <laughs> um, so this is a, a slide I pulled off the internet. Um, it's a grocery store. I believe it's a whole food store, if I remember the article correctly. And this is a grocery store with honeybees still alive. And if we lost all our honeybees, you see the consequences of what we had to choose from in our produce aisles. So you, you lose, I believe these are onions, you lose apples, you lose limes. I'm surprised these oranges didn't disappear because there's a big market for bees going in to pollinate the, uh, the orange groves. You lose your avocados, uh, lemons, your berries over here get wiped out. Um, and then back here, all your greens, some of those disappear. Uh, they say one third of every bite you take is because bees are pollinating uh, the foods, uh, staples that we're trying to eat. And this is a really interesting one, your dairy choices. You say, well, you don't need cows or bees to pollinate cows or anything like that. But the, the link is, if I don't have the, the, the feed for the cows, you don't have the cows. So if you don't have bees pollinating the grasses and everything else that you don't think of as commercial foods, the clovers and, and those kind of crops, you, your, your cows won't be able to survive as well. So that also takes wow. down your dairy production. Counterintuitive. Uh, any questions? Wait. I don't know. There's one in the chat that says, how do you prevent Varroa mite from getting foothold in your hives? Okay. so. There's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Um, typically, when I talk about making the splits in the spring and I remove the queen, there's a 30-day-ish period of time when the varroa mites aren't able to reproduce because there's not a queen laying eggs. There's no larvae for them to crawl into and reproduce. So you get this pent-up demand. All the mites after 30 days are hanging out on the bees. There's no larvae for them to be in. And, and they can sense when a larvae is about to be capped because the pheromone changes every 24 hours on that larvae. So they can tell the difference between a one day old larvae, two, three, four, five day old larvae. A five day old larvae was an egg for three days, a larvae for five, so it's about to be capped. When the queen starts laying, she doesn't start laying thousands of eggs a day. She's still trying to fumble around and lay 50 or 60 eggs. Well, in three days, when those become larvae, you've got 50 or 60 hosts. And these mites, there might be hundreds of them, all pile into those cells and get capped. And in the perfect world, there is a parasite to host relationship and that gets exceeded. You, you have two or three mites get in on that larvae and they just suck the, the pachesis out of that larvae and it dies. Well, if it dies, there's no more food for them to consume. 
they can't dig their, themselves out of the cocoon and wax capping, so they also die. So it's a weakness in the Varroa mite. And that's one of the things that was discovered because um, these Africanized bees that we talk about, Varroa doesn't seem to affect them very much because they're always swarming. They're always doing this grow, swarm, grow, swarm, grow, swarm. And so the, the Varroa mite can't live in, in that type of uh, a condition. And then you can move into your organic treatments. I personally use uh, it's oxalic acid, uh, commonly known as wood bleach. And you can apply it in a couple different methods. You can dissolve it in water and it's called a dribble. And you put, uh, I don't know, I don't ever use it, five milliliters, I think, in between each frame. You'd kind of like wet down the bees and the, and the wood bleach the, the acid and it doesn't harm the bees. Uh, they've done lots of studies at different low levels and they get stupid crazy about the percentages of the oxalic acid that they put in it and the bees don't seem to be affected by it. Uh, but it burns the varroa mite and just like the bee, once the varroa mite's exoskeleton is damaged, it bleeds. Uh, it doesn't have any way to uh, have the blood coagulate, and so it bleeds out. The other thing that the acid does is those varroa mite, if you look underneath, uh, look at them under a high powered uh, microscope, they have like little balloons on their feet as suction pads, and those get damaged. And so they'll lose the ability to hold on to the bee and fall off and, and die at the bottom of your hive. Uh, the method I like to use is vaporization. So you have a, it's basically a hot plate. Uh, you plug it into, or you attach it to a car battery or a tractor battery. You start with it cold. You put your dose, which is usually two grams of wood bleach per eight to 10 frame deep uh, brood box. You stick it in the entrance. You attach it to the battery. It heats up. And the interesting thing about uh, oxalic acid is it, it's a, a chemistry term, it sublimates. So typically things go from solid to liquid to gas. And when you sublimate, you skip the liquid phase. So oxalic acid uh, has water molecules attached to it. So the first thing it does is it steams and then it heats up more and then it goes into a vapor. And because it, uh, the vapor pressure expands so great in your pad, or your, your, your pan, excuse me, it covers the entire inner surface of the hive with this acid. And then when the bees walk by, hopefully it's a passive type of interaction. The bee walks by, it bumps against a crystal, the crystal just happens to bump against the mite, and it, and it starts that process of the mite dying. Um, you have to do that uh, repeatedly for a month. So every three to five days, you do the same process over and over again. You want to get to that 30 day mark so that you've covered a whole brood cycle. So every cell that was capped prior to you starting or every egg that was laid from the day you started has gone through its whole gestation period and the bee has come out. And that way you can, again, knock down the mite levels. A third way you can you can control the mites, you can get into the more harsh chemicals. These are the ones that the bees can be resistant to. Um, I don't use them. I'm not opposed to using them. Uh, I just choose not to. But if you were a beekeeper and you're, you discovered that your hive is really infested with mites and you need to get rid of them now, you don't have 30 days to wait you would use one of these and it, it, it pretty much decimates the mites uh, in a few days. Um, they say leave it in for, I think it's 42 days, but essentially the mites, the mites are dead uh, really in a real short time period. Um, you know, I would some, yeah, I just don't use them because I, I don't want that product in my hive. Uh, the wax can absorb it and the wax can 
with the absorption of it can cause the queens to lay funny. So it can be detrimental to your colony in the long run. A short two minute answer. <laughs> Pretty fascinating process, my. Any other questions? Anybody want to be a beekeeper? Wants to become a beekeeper? <laughs> Interested in becoming a beekeeper? I like to hear stories about beekeepers. I don't think I want to be one. <laughs> I don't think I want to be one. It's all the buzz. Come on. Of course. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> I know. I think it's fascinating. I mean, the the science is is uh, is wonderfully Amazing. creative. Yeah. Yeah. If if you really want a lesson in biology, or if you really want to instill that there's a higher power out there, look at a look at a bee colony and look what it can do. You can you really people don't think about this way, but you can really play with the bees. You can make them react because it's genetically in their tiny, tiny little brain to do something. Like if I want to make queens, all I have to do is go out to a hive and pull the queen out, make a split and wait. I may get six queen cells. I may get 20 queen cells, but I can force them to do that. If I want them to, to raise a lot of drones, if I feed them certain uh, frames, uh, something I didn't talk about is if you look at the cells that the bees are raised in, a worker cell is, is smaller in diameter, smaller opening than a drone cell. And the queen, when she's laying an egg, will put her head in there with her antennas out and she can measure that opening. And she says, if this is a small opening, I'm gonna pass an egg and when it goes down my ovary duct, I'm going to release some sperm and I'm going to fertilize that egg and it becomes a female. If she measures that cell and it's larger, she says, oh, this is going to be a drone. Doesn't fertilize it. And that's how you get males and females out of the same queen. She controls that. So it's just, just amazing. I, I hit some button. I don't know what I did. But... Oh, you're laying on your side. It's okay, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, I guess it wasn't <laughs> the voice button. It was the picture button. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I thank you kindly for a very, very informative program. Boy, um, I'll, I'll be more thoughtful when I see honeybees floating around uh, in the future here and yeah. Realize they're heavy workers. Yeah. And if anybody that listens to this is interested in becoming a beekeeper, there is a club we meet in Hail at the old high school at uh, 415 East Main Street, the second Wednesday of the month at 630 to 8. Huh. Sounds interesting. Yeah. It's free of charge. Come and learn about it. Um there's uh, also, and depending on where you're located, if you go to michiganbees.org, it's the Michigan Beekeepers Association website, and it lists all the clubs affiliated with the Michigan Beekeepers. So there's clubs all over the state, UP, Traverse City, uh, a lot of them uh, mid-state and below, east and west coast. But our club, the, the Sunrise Side Beekeepers, is the closest one to Alpino. I'm going to have to keep an eye out on the bees when they're invading my bee balm plant because now I'll watch to see which way they're going. Yeah, yeah. You can, <laughs> there's a technique called lining where you can do that. You can catch a bee or put food out like and watch which direction it flies like and, how, and how long it takes it to get to some place you just how the old timers would find colonies and trees to capture them. Oh. Yeah, they love the bee balm plant that I have in my front yard. Yeah. And if you if you plant gardens, think uh, do some research on what what 
honeybees or, or bumblebees like and try to plant something that's uh, always blooming. So something early in the spring, something late spring, some early summer, some midsummer, some late summer, some early fall, some late fall. Um, Cause you'll, you'll, as long as there's forage out, you'll, you'll get the bees on a good day. All right, well, thank you. All right, take <laughs> care. You. you too.